baby. Get it. Let's start off with what comes in the box. The unboxing process isn't quite the experience of the Z270 Maximus Hero board I reviewed in the card section now, but the packaging is certainly clean, simple and informative. Underneath the motherboard in the box you get a user's manual, three SATA cables, a super handy Q connector, the lovely hard PCB high bandwidth SLI bridge, a rear IO shield, M.2 screws, a CPU installation thing which just isn't really necessary, and a support DVD, but we all know what we think of those. Taking a look around the motherboard itself, we see a nice white and black aesthetic with grey heat sinks around the CPU socket and a white cover over the Z270 chipset area. The RAM dims, of course, of which there are four, are nicely colour coded and come in black and grey. The PCIe lanes are also coloured black and grey with the top X16 stock taking the grey colour and being reinforced with that metal shroud for increased strength, as if to say kind of I'm the dominant one. Talking of PCIe slots, they come in the following order, X1, X16 with the metal guard, X1, X1. X16. This also has the metal guard X1 and X16. Now the bandwidth at which they run will vary depending on your configuration of expansion cards. You're not going to be able to get full X16 bandwidth out of three slots for example because Z270 is limited in terms of PCI lanes but in terms of physical size that's what they are and they all run on the PCI 3.0 standard. Spinning around to the rear IO we have DVI display port and HDMI display connectors, USB 3.1 type A and type C, 4 USB 3.0 type A ports, 3.5mm 7.1 audio output jacks with an optical connector, a gigabit ethernet and finally a legacy a PS2 keyboard and mouse combo which is nice to have. No USB 2 ports here, a pair would have been nice for legacy and reliability, backwards compatibility purposes but for the most part zero complaints on this front. But damn that DVI connector looks so dated on there, oh we'll miss you when you leave us buddy. On a serious note then, moving around to motherboard connectors, the 6 fan headers, all the better 4 pin variant, 2 above the CPU and whilst 3 would be nice here, there is another one off just to the right on the other side of the RAM dim connections. One in between the front panel connectors and front panel USB and 2 off to the bottom right of the rear I.O. Across the bottom there's a nice selection of ports and connectors with 3 USB 2.0 front panel connections, seems mildly overkill but I'm not complaining, a USB 3.0 connector, the front panel block with those front panel audio connectors and power reset buttons, there's an RGB header which allows RGB strips to be controlled through motherboard software which is really really nice. There's also a few easter eggs down here such as the 10 pin serial port connector and TPM connector. There's also a thunderbolt header placed above the bottom PCIe lane and a load of thermal sensors on the board if you wanted to connect those up. Down both sides we have the crystal sound audio chipset with an RGB controllable audio trace and down the right hand side the aforementioned 4 pin fan header. A 24 pin motherboard power connector of course as well and 6 SATA 3 6 gigabit connections. The other piece on the motherboard power connectors puzzle is of course the 8 pin affair located at the top left of the board. There's also two M.2 slots, one slightly shortened and the other full length for faster NVMe SSDs. Whilst this board does sadly lack the fantastic Q code display for easy diagnostics, there is an easy XMP bar switch and buttons for power and memo K which are all great additions. If you'd have watched my Asus Republic of Gamers Maximus 9 Hero review, you might have seemed somewhat disappointed to see the features that this motherboard sacrifices over its higher end bigger brother. And it's those three words you have to keep in mind, higher end model. This motherboard is a lot cheaper than that Hero board and subsequently has to be differentiated with the loss of certain features. Things you don't lose though is the Z270 chipset every high end Cable 8 builder should be using, which gives you better overclocking support, better IO configurations, uh, more storage connectivity options and a more well-rounded experience with an increased number of PCIe lanes. On the topic of overclocking, this board is certainly capable, but if you're desperate for that 7700K of yours to hit in excess of 5GHz, you may want to step up a little bit higher. The motherboard VRM heatsinks can certainly cope with overclocking, but for enthusiast kind of grade things, you will want to go a little bit higher. The included Asus software suite is as thorough as ever, and one of their highlight standout pieces of software is the automatic overclocking. Now what this basically does is it sends a little bit more power and uh, increases 
increases your CPU speed in small increments and then test the stability test each time. If the chip is stable, it'll keep going. Admittedly, I just wanted to have an excuse to show this little pseudocode animation that I already made from another review. If you want to see even more of this board in action, check out my $1,000 budget kind of 1070 PC build guide, which will be watchable in the card section now on release. Aesthetically, I like this board. The black and white isn't in your face and isn't too compromising in terms of your desired colour scheme and should fit in pretty well. But should you buy this motherboard? Now that depends uh, you on the consumer and what you need. A better question perhaps, who is this board aimed at? It's a great entry into the higher end Z270 chipset for those not wanting to break the bank. I also see this motherboard as a great option for professionals wanted at the expanded feature set of the Z270 chipset and more expansion slots and better I.O. But professionals who don't need the power or extra expense associated with X99. Overall it really is a fantastic board and one that differentiates itself from Asus's higher end Z270 options whilst maintaining the core features that the Z170 and Z270 motherboard owners have come to love and demand. As I said, for more on this board to see it in action in my recent $1,000 PC build guide, check the card section now. Drop a like to show some love and appreciation on this video and subscribe for more content like this. As always though, we'll see you in the next Geekawatt video.